Hello and welcome to the latest of my deep dive videos. Today I'm going to explore how astrology can inform our understanding of our relationship needs, how we can get the most out of ourselves, deepen our understanding of how we can link in the most successful ways, not just in deep, romantic, intimate relationships, but in our relationships in general. I'm also going to take a, a snapshot look at this year's Valentine's Day on the 14th of February to see what we can understand, what information we can draw down from that that can guide us all. If you're a returning viewer to my channel, thank you so much for joining me once more. If you're new, it's great to have you with us. This is very much a community, so please do comment and interact. I do respond to each one. And please like and subscribe. First of all, I just want to share with you how I'm going to structure this presentation. So first up, I want to look at some of the big issues that uh, consultant astrologers look for in uh, relationship analysis. So I will go through those first of all. I'm then going to share some of the background to Valentine's Day itself. I'm then go on, going to go on to take a look at that uh, solar chart for Valentine's Day this year. We've got some very important influences there, not least that the Sun is conjunct Saturn, What's that going to inform us? But also, Venus and Neptune are in a very romantic relationship. But there's also something else I need to tell you about that's incredibly exciting, and it involves Venus and Mars. But once I go through that, I will give you a taste of what you can expect for your Valentine's Day, whatever your status, in terms of the Sun or the Ascendant, the choice is yours. Now if you would like to understand more about more serious astrology you can see the link beneath this uh, video and there are relationship readings that I offer, synastry readings, but there are some other uh, relationship uh, insights I can offer as well. But if you would like to understand more about your own nativity, which is the starting point, my life roadmap report is something that can really help you to understand in a much closer way what really makes you tick. But also some of the things that you may find a bit more challenging. But a more intimate relationship with those issues can help you prosper, as can knowing much more about your strengths. And also my special package, you can get your year ahead forecast, all based on your personal birth data of time, date and place of birth and there's 30% off. Please see the link below. So in natal astrology when we're looking at relationships what are the things that I look out for? Well obviously the ascendant is how we meet the world. This is if you like our sunrise. This is where we're excited, we're very much passionate about what we want to achieve as individuals. So it has a kind of Aries feel, and therefore the planet Mars, which is very much about action and initiative, is going to be very much the fore. But the fourth house cusp, the IC, the Imancoli, is very much about our emotional needs, about the need for shelter and to feel secure. And that's important in relationships. It's not all about glamour, laughter and attraction. But then at the opposite end of the horizon from the ascendant is the descendant. This is a very under discussed topic, particularly amongst YouTube astrologers. And this is where we're likely to uh, develop our mode of relating. It depends on each natal horoscope because you have to take the chart in the round. You have to synthesize it. But that seventh house cusp is vitally important. Now, if you've got someone who's got Jupiter there, they're likely to be quite bubbly and optimistic about how they can link to somebody else. If you have Saturn there, this is going to be someone who's much more cautious. If we have the moon there, it could be someone who's quite the people pleaser. If we have Venus there, 
well, that person will have a gift for relating to people quite skillfully. So the descendant is vitally important in a natal horoscope and tells us a lot. But of course, how do the two descendants for two different charts fit together? Well, that's another thing. That's called synastry. But the descendant is a massive part of uh, the understanding that we can forge. But the moon is also crucially important too, because the moon is about our emotional needs. It's very much in keeping with that fourth house cusp. How do things feel? We could be with someone that we find enormously attractive, amusing, but actually not feel that we'd be that comfortable with them on a daily basis. So the moon is really important. If you're a home lover, but the person you're attracted to is an adventurer, and say their moon is in Sagittarius, then it's not necessarily going to work out, even though you may really be drawn to one another. Now Mars, of course, is very much to do with that uh, sexual energy, and self-confidence and assertion. It's also the planet of impulse. And of course, in its rulership of Scorpio, it's very much the planet of desire. You could say also that Mars is the planet of instant gratification. So we don't have good impulse control. Mars could see us making all sorts of relationship decisions that aren't necessarily well thought through, but it does give us the impetus to make a move. And Mars actually forges a great link with another planet in the Valentine's Day chart. So I'm going to tell you about that. Now, of course, you know that Venus is very much to do with the more relating side of a relationship because, of course, it rules Libra, which is very much the sign of relating. But Venus also rules Taurus, which is very much about sensuality. So we could have somebody that we're drawn to because they dress nicely, because they have a refinement to them, they're very charming, they're very polite. That's the Libra energy. But the Taurus energy brings that sort of much deeper, sort of earthy pull, where we just, it may be that someone's not actually necessarily in a classic way good looking but there's something about them that stirs us deep within our being so venus has two rulerships just like mars in two different ways now of course the sun position is very important but one of the myths that i would really like to dispel is that whenever we see comparisons between different sun signs usually in popular media I feel that this really does give astrology a bad name because if you had somebody for example who had the sun in Taurus and somebody else had the sun in Scorpio those kind of guides would say well they can't possibly get on because they're opposite they're both fixed therefore quite inflexible and therefore uh, neither side gives way but actually wherever the seventh house is from the sun so in the case of Taurus that would be Scorpio in the case of Scorpio that would be Taurus that actually can work very well it's rather like the descendant in uh, more uh, technical astrology so don't discount oppositions the squares yes they can be challenging but let's say for example somebody has their son at the start of Taurus, but uh, the other person's son is at the end of Leo, well, you end up with a trine. It's just a disassociate trine. So if someone's reading that magazine and it says, well, there's no way that uh, Taurus and Leo can get on, again, both fixed signs, too stubborn, blah, blah, not true. So these are the things, that's definitely a myth. You could have... Um, experiences because of your natal horoscope where particular zodiac signs have proved to be quite challenging. Um, That is true of me. I have a lot of planets in Aquarius. So I get on extremely well with Leo ascendant people and Leos. But Leo, Moon and Mars could be more challenging for me because I have very sensitive planets in Aquarius all in the fourth house. 
but it doesn't make those people bad it just makes those people not necessarily right for me and I have very good relationships with people with Leo ascendant and also Leo so it's important to uh, to not be too steered by our past experiences. I think most of us have probably gone out with someone where it ended a little bit rockily and you know we think we're never ever going to go out with a person of that uh, zodiac sign again. Try to rinse that out of your mind because each person's nativity is so different that's what we really need to understand. Now, of course, I did mention before about Saturn being on the descendant and Saturn can be very important when we're comparing two charts or even in terms of an individual. If an individual, for example, has Saturn on the first house, they could be extremely shy if it's very, very close to the ascendant and the ascendant is in, say, Capricorn, which can be quite reserved until it gets going. Now, it could be Saturn on the ascendant in Leo could give a certain amount of modification for that desire for admiration. Also, Saturn on the Ascendant in Libra could make someone in some ways a little bit less superficial. So there's different ways that we can integrate these different planetary uh, impacts. But of course, we can also talk about the asteroids. Now, one that does get talked about quite a lot is Black Moon Lilith, currently in the sign of Leo. And this can be very much to do with forbidden fruit. Can be what we secretly lust for, but may not necessarily have the confidence to act out. For some people, it could be to do with repressed urges. Now, we live in a society certainly in the Western world, which gives us the permission to be more individualistic than ever it did when I was a kid. Then everybody had to be a particular uniform way, which of course a lot of people pushed back against in the 60s. We had the, cult, you know, the counter culture revolution and in some ways it was really needed. Um, but I feel that there are still some people who can find it very difficult to talk about their sexuality at all and you can find other people who are just very comfortable and say how do you identify who are you attracted to it's not a big deal for them at all and it's not a big deal for me to talk about it but it will still be for some people and that can be black moon lilith now eros i did a special on eros moving into capricorn only last week please check out the link beneath this video to see that. That's obviously the Greek uh, mythology of the uh, son of Venus. And this is very much to do with desire and erotic love, but it can be what we're passionate about in general. So if you have it in an earth sign, security and money are going to be more attractive than you have in it in the air sign, where it's going to be much more about conversation and ideas. Now, in astrology, we also have the asteroid Cupido, which basically follows the Roman tradition. And this is the initial hit of lust and passion. And it just so happens on this Valentine's Day that they're almost side by side in the earthy sign of Capricorn. But then we also, of course, have the midpoint between Venus and and Mars and this is critical for me when I cast a chart for a client that's asking a relationship question this gives me a lot of ideas about who they are so for example if the midpoint between Venus and Mars was in Scorpio and in the eighth house this is a person whose romantic desires are very deep indeed if the same combination was let's say for example in an air sign but in the third house this definitely would be someone who needs their mind turning on and then that can help them to get into that more intimate mode. So the midpoint between Venus and Mars, very important when we look at two different charts. So how do we look at charts? Well, synastry is where we take each person's chart and we just overlay them. If you have some important planets in the overlay in person one seventh house, that can be very beneficial, as can the fifth house. Seventh house relating, boundaries, but the fifth house very much to do with romance, affection, warmth, delight, children. Now, my wife has a lot 
of planet three activity in the fifth house as she has juno which is very much about uh, uh deep devotion really relationships so in a fixed sign such like scorpio you're very much in or out well for her in the fifth house and it's in and it's also forging a wonderful link to jupiter in cancer jupiter in cancer exalted in the 12th house so this points towards someone who feels their relationship very deeply but elisa also has uh, black moon lilith and cupido in a conjunction with mars and pluto in scorpio now i'm not going to say too much more but you may be wondering if i sometimes look a little bit uh, like i'm having to keep up but no seriously uh, it is a wonderful collection of influences which shows a lot about commitment and a deep understanding of the closeness that Scorpio can provide. But synastry analysis can have its drawbacks. So for example, if you have one person's sun sits close to another person's Venus, the sun will always be very protective to the Venus, uh, to the moon, sorry. Now, in traditional astrology, where it's more based on male and female, if it was the male's sun close to the woman's moon, that was considered to be extremely beneficial. But what happens if Saturn on one of those two charts is actually pointing towards another influence in a negative way? So this is what an astrologer has to synthesize. But there is another form of relationship analysis called composite analysis. And this is where we take the two charts and we basically add them together at the shortest point between each of the influences. And we come up with a relationship report of the relationship so if you like the uh, personality of what the two people share so we all know that we can have one experience with one person and then have a completely different relationship with somebody else so we may relate to some people in different ways because certainly with Saturn and Pluto those can affect us very very uh, much uh, in different relationships so composite analysis is great used in conjunction pardon the pun with synastry because it helps the astrologer to get the overall picture but then you still need to drill down because there could be some crucial standout uh, inhibitors usually saturn and pluto not always um, that can come along and bosh even some good things and then, of course, we have timing. So each person, when we're born, we have our nativity, but our nativity develops and evolves through secondary progressions and also directed astrology. And that can be very, or those can be very influential. So sometimes it's not even our nativity that's active when we meet somebody. So the two charts could come together well, so you can get clients saying, well, look, our charts match so well together. Why isn't this happening? It's timing. And because those two people and those two charts will have evolved from whence they were born. Now let's just get that uh, Valentine's chart wheel up on the screen. I haven't gone into huge detail on this because obviously we can't have a time. Therefore, I've stripped out, I've produced this chart at noon, but I've stripped out the ascendant, obviously usually critical, the descendant, the midheaven and the fourth house because it's a nominal time. I don't want to confuse things. So the big takeout is where is the sun? It's in Aquarius, of course, as it would be each year, but it is in a conjunction with Saturn. So this Valentine's Day, if you're in a relationship which is a good friendship, that may be the thing that you're going to celebrate. You may have had your ups and downs, but what can happen in a, a synastry chart particularly is if Saturn's quite close to the sun, you might feel that that would be quite inhibiting. And it can be, but it's also very anchoring. And Saturn doesn't let, like to let go of the sun or the sun grips the Saturn's security. So this is the type of stuff you obviously give to clients as, as time goes on. But I would say that if you don't see a future for your relationship, that particular aspect will test it on this event. But you can see that Venus and Neptune in Pisces, Neptune obviously at home, it's the co-regent of this sign, are in a beautiful conjunction, which is very spiritual and very, very, very lovely indeed. So 
it's arguable with them in the second solar house of the chart beginning with the sun uh, being in Aquarius that enjoying good food and good wine is definitely going to be a factor on this particular year. Now, of course, some people would say, well, Valentine's Day is always about those things. But there will be lots of people in different types of relationships, some that are semi-detached, some that are secret, some that are broken down. There will be some that are happy-ish, but don't have any great expectation there's going to be roses or chocolates or a meal out. Well, what's that rubbish all about? You know, you know I really care about you and that person may really care about them. They just may feel that Valentine's Day is just a commercial, superficial exercise. And I'm sure a lot of us would agree with that, to be honest. But Venus and Neptune can promote a bit more of an idealistic magic in the event. But I just wanted to point out about Jupiter. I mentioned or hinted about this earlier. Jupiter and Aries is very much about go-getting. It's forging a fantastic link to Mars, the ruler of Aries, in the chatterbox Gemini. If you want to ask somebody out, that's a really good, uh, a good aspect to have because it could give you a little bit more confidence to do it. Now, it could be said that with Venus and Neptune in that conjunction, those secret or clandestine relationships or perhaps reminiscences about someone from our past. Yes, that old flame. I'm not talking about twin flames here. I'll leave that stuff to my wife. But certainly in terms of the astrology, Neptune could make us extremely nostalgic, especially with Venus. So we could be thinking about someone who sadly has died or someone we're no longer with because circumstances didn't make it possible. So I feel that... If you do want to take the initiative and there's somebody you know, I think what Venus and Neptune are saying is use a degree of subtlety, but Venus and, uh, pardon me, Jupiter and Mars are saying nothing will happen unless somebody makes that first move. So Mars being the planet of initiative certainly gives an opportunity to send that text message, to send that card. Now we also have at the top of the chart there, you can see Eros, and Cupid, you know, two different traditions of Greek and Roman, both the son of Venus, but they're in the very earthy Capricorn, and they're forging a sensational link to the midpoint between Venus and Mars, which is at three degrees in Taurus. So that earth element, which is reflected by Venus, which of course governs the sign of Taurus, that second house energy for the sun being in Aquarius. So if you are somebody who seriously wants to impress somebody, I feel that a meal, whether you cook it at home, even if it's something fairly simple, the thought that goes into that preparation, even if you're sat by a fire or go somewhere just very, very peaceful uh, in nature, could be a lovely way to go on a first date or go out with an existing partner and find some very sensual magic between you. So I think that's very sexy stuff, to be honest, because Eros loves being in Capricorn. Somebody wrote in to tell me that Marilyn Monroe had her Eros in Capricorn, and it's where I have mine, and my wife has hers, and they're conjunct. So we're going to be blessed by Eros and Cupid being together on this event. But seriously... I do understand that not everybody's relationship has gone well or their experience with relationships may have been quite heartbreaking, whether it's family breakdown, desertion, loss through death. Um, my father died when I was eight and we lost our dad, our house, our business, and we were in absolute abject poverty for the rest of my childhood and my mum really grieved about it it wasn't something she particularly got over so that loss around a relationship doesn't have to be in a romantic context has made me very sensitive to people who are on their own or up against it and of course we're also in a big financial uh, retraction at the moment which is affecting people's ability to spoil one another or to take risks and you can see that Jupiter is actually in a square with both um, Cupid and uh, Eros. And perhaps that saying is that, yes, we can try to impress somebody. We can try to sort of do the grand gesture. 
but I think it's the sincere gesture that will work out best. Also, you can see that Chiron uh, is in the first house and it is in a sextile with Mars. So Mars can strengthen Chiron's sensitivity, but in the first house in Aries, that's very much about our identity. So if your identity is feeling rather vulnerable at the moment and you're not sure you want to take a risk, Mars is actually giving you a little bit of encouragement. Again, there are different techniques. You know, we don't necessarily even have to say a word. There are non-verbal communications we can use if we see someone at work or there's someone we're encountering each day on our movements. Uh, there are different ways we can just strike up a conversation which is totally non-personal, just to gauge if that person seems to be responding to us. So whatever your circumstances, I totally understand that Valentine's Day itself can be a bit of a commercial exercise but just for a, a little bit of uh, context I wanted to explain to you some research I did about seven years ago so Valentine's Day is actually a Christian uh, festival but some people believe that its origins were actually in the festival of Lupercalia a Roman festival that went between the 13th and 15th of February now, that festival apparently included naked men spanking local maidens to ensure their fertility. And it was really popular into the 5th century after Anno Domini. Um, and over a century after Christianity became the state religion of Rome, of, of Italy. So, unsurprisingly, the... Uh, early Christians were less than impressed by such naughtiness and tried to stop the celebrations. But they were met with so much opposition that they had to change tack and made the festival into a saint's day, thus taming the wider excesses that had marked Lupercalia. It's also said that St. Valentine uh, flouted a ban by Emperor Claudius II forbidding young men to marry by conducting secret wedding ceremonies. But he paid a heavy price um, because uh, for his disobedience, he was actually said to be uh, killed on the 14th of February. But he is the patron saint of lovers, epileptics and beekeepers. But according to the legend, St. Valentine signed a letter from your Valentine to his jailer's daughter, whom he had befriended and healed from blindness. Another common legend states that he defied the emperor's orders and secretly married couples to spare the husbands from war. I'm sure there's a lot of poor women in Russia who wish they could use that tactic at the present time. So seriously, that gives you a little bit of context about Valentine's Day. We've gone over the chart for the day. It's just a noon chart. Uh, but there are some important and interesting themes threaded through that. And just talked a little bit about relationships in general, but also how, in a consulting sense, I approach understanding relationship analysis. Now, please stay with me. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavour for each of the zodiac signs in terms of this Valentine's Day. Well, for sure, Aries, if there's somebody you've got a bit of a secret crush on, the best way to try to cultivate this tie is through some kind of shared interest or hobby or just basically being friendly. If you're in a long-standing relationship, I do feel it's possible with Venus being in your 12th house that if you do feel that you're not nurtured and understood at a more psychological level and the way you'd like, Saturn, next to the Sun, could be seeing you think about whether you want this tie for the longer term. But if you are single, the fact that Jupiter, Chiron and Juno are all in your sign and all forging a pretty healthy link to Mars and... Uh, you know, Jupiter's forging also a great link to Mercury. If you feel confident enough to take a little bit of a risk, go for it. Taurus. Now for you, of course, the sun being in the sign of Aquarius pushes you into the public eye. Is there somebody through your work who's showing more 
than a modicum of interest in you. They may be impressed because you're someone they see as being very capable, competent, authoritative. They may want you to take the lead. Also, Venus and Neptune are in your sector of friendship. So um, maybe you need to take the lead around this particular situation. Mars is in your second house, which could be promoting the desire side of your nature. It's a rare Taurus that doesn't appreciate the creature comforts of life. Anything to do with a nice gentle massage or some Epsom salts, candles, food and wine, of course. These are the things that you're really going to appreciate. And with that midpoint between Venus and Mars in your sign, do not underestimate your sexual charisma at this time. Whatever your circumstances and however old you are. Gemini. Now obviously the Sun is in house 9 but it's in that conjunction with Saturn. If you're in a relationship with someone who has a very different philosophy to you or maybe you're at a distance, they're at one end of the country or they're overseas or somehow there's some kind of limitation on meeting up due to travel restrictions, that could be very frustrating. But Venus and Neptune are quite high in your chart and it may be difficult to disguise how you feel with that, but then you can demonstrate your charm in a beautiful way. Mars in your sign is giving you a lot of push to take the lead. It's forging a great link, remember, with Jupiter and Jupiter in turn with your ruler Mercury. So there's a lot to go for there. So I just feel that unless there's something that's inhibiting getting together through distance, borders, documentation, uh, or different philosophies. If you have very different philosophies, I feel it can be hard going in relationships. In uh, certain cultures, people are matched with other people each of the family know, which can, of course, seem out of kilter with Western culture. But one of the things that families say in these situations that those shared values are invaluable in terms of making things sustainable between two people. You have to have attraction as well, of course, but if you're attracted to someone at the moment who sees life completely 180 different to you, that may be a bit challenging. Cancer. Now, for you, Saturn and the Sun in the eighth house suggest that if there's not a lot of money, in the relationship at the moment, it could be causing quite a lot of anxiety. Totally understandable. But you do have Venus and Neptune in your ninth house. What you could do if your short-term financial situation is a little bit uh, tense, you could plan something further down the track, whether it's a day out, uh, go into a show or a play or to watch a band or to an art exhibition. These things can be done a little bit more economically, but those are the type of things that probably would make your heart sing at the present time. If you are more flush, if you can jet off somewhere or arrange to jet off or go somewhere a little bit more exotic, for, then that's going to be something that really appeals to you. Now, Leo, having the Sun and Saturn together in your seventh house is asking you to be very honest and firm about your boundaries. But having Venus and Neptune together in the eighth house could be a great way to get up close and personal if your relationship is more stable and working well. If you're single, I feel that the fact there's quite a lot of Aries energy around this event, and of course Mars in your sector of friendship, that's giving you the hint. Get out and mix and mingle. Even if you don't necessarily get close to someone on Valentine's Day itself, just as the sun's coming to the end of its journey in the sign of Aquarius, Mercury is still there lighting things up. There's also going to be a glorious link between Venus and Jupiter that occurs at the end of February and the start of March, which can be really exciting for you when it comes to breaking out and being more spontaneous. Which brings us to Virgo. Well, having Venus and Neptune uh, in your opposite sign can help you to demonstrate your feelings in a very soothing and uh, a very 
uh, charming way. But having Saturn on the Sun can bring more to the fore that other parts of your nature which can be quite to the point and direct and actually be quite taken up with the smaller picture. Watch that because that can be a bit of a mood breaker. So I feel that what you're being given by Venus and Neptune is an opportunity, so don't sweat the small stuff. Libra, now for you having the Sun very close to Saturn after two and a half years of Saturn really pulverizing your uh, romantic sector might seem a bit rich. But what does Venus and Neptune say? Well, I think actually they're very much about sacrifice. But I've been encouraging you for a long time now not to be sacri uh, so sacrificing and to build up your uh, boundaries. And I wouldn't give up on that. You do have Mercury in a very flirty location in a great link with Jupiter and a great link with Mars. Something spontaneous could happen, but it wouldn't be a complete surprise if someone in your everyday world or even your job around your job is someone who's capturing your imagination. Now, if you are in a settled relationship, I think Venus and Neptune together would be a wonderful prompt to go to a spa or give each other a lovely massage. Spoil your partner in those small but incredibly thoughtful ways. Scorpio. Now, I mentioned about my wife. Hot stuff, eh? Well, of course, Pluto and Mars are your two rulers. Mars is in that glorious link to Jupiter, but Mars is in your eighth solar house. It doesn't get much hotter than that. So with Jupiter being in your sixth house, maybe the important thing there is not to analyze things too much. If you get the feeling that you're drawn towards someone, well, perhaps you should respond to that. What the sun and, and Saturn are saying is you need to feel safe and secure. But if you want to manifest your affection, Venus and Neptune, give you a wonderful moment of magic if you can seize it. Which brings us to Sagittarius. The last couple of years have seen perhaps some challenges about the way you express yourself and people haven't always found it easy. But I feel that you can say what you mean, which means that you're much more likely to be sincere. You have Mars in your sector of relating, it's not the best place to have Mars in a natal horoscope, but I think in a solar horoscope, it's generally giving you a lot of encouragement. It doesn't come out of shadow until the 15th of March. So it's just saying don't try too hard, but it forges such a charismatic link to your ruler, Jupiter. There's lots to go for, but Neptune and Venus together are saying, show your heart, show your feelings, show your vulnerabilities. Capricorn. Now, of course, Pluto, just in the last degree of your sign at the present time before it moves on March the 23rd for that 11 week sojourn into Aquarius. But it is forging a broadly very positive link to both Venus and also Neptune. If you feel a lot for someone, it's likely that their values are quite compatible to yours. If you don't feel a lot for someone and it feels you jar with one another, either the way they speak or sound doesn't quite work for you. Maybe it's a tonal thing, or maybe it is down to raw resources. You know, maybe it's someone that you just don't feel that their approach to money and life will ever match yours. But if you are with someone whose values do match, this could be an enchanting uh, day for you. Aquarius, of course, you are the host of this event each year. And the sun being conjunct Saturn is probably going to dampen your physicality a little bit. But Venus and Neptune in the second house, well, even if you're someone who lives a rather aesthetic lifestyle, you know, perhaps like a, a Trappist monk. Remember, Trappist monks make that fine um, continental beer as well. Give yourself permission to enjoy some sensual pleasures or some calorific goodies. And if you're single, Mars being in your fifth house is giving you a lot of sex appeal at the moment. What are you waiting for? Which brings us to Pisces. Last but never least, you're hosting your ruler, Neptune, in that beautiful conjunction with Venus. But I feel sincerity is very important to you at the moment. If there is some legacy issue, either that has affected you even though you're not in a relationship and you've not been able to 
to make yourself available, um, it wouldn't be a surprise that at this particular time that is really feeling quite a painful thing to process. But what Venus and Neptune are saying is that your essence, your kindness, your spirituality, sometimes your elusiveness are all floating around and can be very alluring. But if you do get involved with someone, just be aware of the psychological dimension. If there's someone who doesn't really get your fears and anxieties, I would steer completely clear. If you're in an existing relationship and that's what you're experiencing, that could be a tiebreaker at this present time. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Wishing you all the best. Please like, comment or subscribe.